You're watching the BJ Five Gear Lockdown Talks. My name is Misha, and I'm here with my co-host Bram. Thank you for tuning in. If you have been watching the show earlier on uh, and you like it, also make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and let us know in the comments below what you think about this episode. Everyone, everyone knows the omoplata as it has been part of jiu-jitsu since the early days and it's taught as one of the major techniques. There are a lot of variations and different ways to set it up and my guest today knows everything about this. Bradley Hill, the omoplata man, is a competitive black belt from the UK who has been teaching jiu-jitsu since he was a teenager and is releasing a new DVD today as of uh, the day that we're recording this, specifically dedicated to the omoplata. Bradley, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Great to having you. Um, what What's your life uh, like right now? How are you doing during this lockdown? Uh, I'm doing okay. It's it's getting a bit long at the moment. Uh, we're, we're quite far into it. I think we're just passing 10 weeks of lockdown. Um, the first few weeks are, are pretty tough to get through. And then you start to be a little bit more productive and sort of accept the fact that you're stuck in your house you try to do what you can and you you can't really train jiu-jitsu uh, and then you get to the point where you've almost surpassed boredom like it's no longer uh, it's really difficult to try to find something productive at this point yeah uh, so we, we do what we can uh, but hopefully it will start to relax soon i think we're supposed to be looking at opening the schools for some social distance training uh, towards the start of July. Okay. So uh, hopefully that happens and then I can get in and see people again that I've not seen for three months. Yeah, yeah. Because th there's no uh, outdoor training being organized at the moment. No, no. Especially not for jiu-jitsu because you can't really grapple with anybody. This is the hardest thing. Is uh, Even trying to do solo drills, it's, it, it's much better than nothing at all and just like resting for three months yeah uh but it's still nothing compared to rolling with somebody right like the i, I get to train a little bit with uh samantha we were doing some team chill mondays on my facebook live and things uh because samantha works in the in the nhs as well she's a respiratory physio so she's been working quite a lot and then when she's uh, when she's got a day off then we'll try and do some training but the few and far between because she's working so hard at the moment yeah um and even when we do train we're kicking the sofa and knocking over plants and everything so <laughs> it's just nowhere near the same as uh, being able to train in the in the uh, academy yeah 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 speaking of solo drills i was thinking maybe this is what happened to like karate and stuff when they had a lockdown in 1800 and then they started to doing those katas, the uh, yeah, yeah. the routines. <laughs> oh, maybe that that's interesting to find out. Yeah, yeah. probably. Uh, the uh, I I started showing some solo drills and a lot of people like I was doing some solo drills of uh, fireman's carries and a lot of people were sort of uh, didn't really understand what it looked like. So that I was doing a different variations of a fireman's carry and people like. This is a jujitsu. <laughs> so who knows? Maybe uh, maybe we can come out with a new jujitsu kata. Yeah, yeah. It definitely <laughs> would be interesting to see. <laughs> what do you think about grappling dummies? Oh, they, they're, they're helpful. I, I made my own. Um, obviously, for the upper body, you're pretty much limited to just upper body attacks with, with the one that you make yourself with like the pillows and the towels in the arms. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot better than just trying to do it on, on your own and imagining what you were doing. It's so much easier to be able to grip onto something. If I'm, if I'm gonna practice arm bar drills or head and arm chokes and things, then I'll use the, the dummy. Right. A lot of times I'm just trying to use speed drills just to get a bit of a repetition going and, and get a sweat on, uh, rather than really practicing in terms of technique. But if, I, if I'm feeling a little bit tired on that day and I wanna spend a bit more time on technique, then I'll grab the dummy and and practice like some 180 arm bars or some Kimura trap sequences because there's quite a lot you can do with it. I think a lot of people are limited with the dummy. You just have to use a bit of imagination. Like uh, even the advanced stuff, like the four draw Kimura trap into like arm bars and inverted triangles is uh, a lot of stuff uh, that I'm practicing at the moment. And do, do you think uh, training with the dummy is more useful than um, doing some strength training or cardio? Um. I, yeah, definitely in terms of, it, it looks at what you're trying to improve. 
Yeah. So, because the, the other part to it is no matter what you do, if you're running every day or you're working out, with the first roll you're going to have, you are going to yeah. gas hard. <laughs> and it, it's you can't really control that because jujitsu is so, so different yeah. to yeah. everything else. It's really difficult to replicate uh, in these circumstances. So I think even running and like lifting weights is, is going to be difficult to cross over back to training again. We just have to, to wait until we can grapple each other again, and then we'll we'll be back on back on top form. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, because you you mentioned uh, uh, trying to figure out what to do during the during the lockdown when you can't train. Besides, obviously trying to find exercises and training to do still. Well, what what else are you uh, uh, keeping busy with? What what uh, do you have your focus on at the moment? Uh, I started off trying to do loads of uh, my vlogs. I had like uh, videos in libraries from 2018 that I've never touched. Mm -hmm. So I finished off some vlogs uh, at the start of the week. Um, I started trying to lift some weights every now and again. Uh, just trying to get my hands on a, as much weight as possible because in the UK, the price of home equipment has gone up dramatically and it's almost impossible to try to find uh, any of these things at the moment. So like uh, the barbell prices have gone up like five times as much. And it, it, then if you do order, like we ordered a kettlebell at the start of the lockdown and it's been almost 10 weeks now where We've still not had the kettlebell delivered to us because it's a non-priority delivery. So even when you do want to order your stuff, unless you have like Amazon Prime and you try to get it next day, you're, you're having a very difficult uh, time getting your equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you, uh, you've you also been working on, besides your content for your YouTube channel, but also on some more exclusive content. You have the, today yeah. is when your DVD is being released, right? The Omoplata DVD. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really exciting. We filmed it, so I filmed it with uh, my sister and her fiance, uh, Tyrone, uh, over in Newcastle, just before the lockdown. It was literally the the weekend before. I finished filming on Sunday, and then the Monday was, okay, we're, we're locking down. Oh, wow. So I got back to London in time, yeah. Uh, so then the whole lockdown, we were just editing and getting everything up onto the website, uh, and now it's it's ready to go today. So it's uh, it's been a, a few a few weeks in the process, but it's nice to be able to see a finished product, a, a landing page, and uh, hopefully see what what people think to the to the techniques. Yeah, yeah. You you uh, well, if we can talk a little bit about the DVD, you are known as the Omoplata Man. Where did this name come from? Because this is something you've had b before the DVD uh, was being produced, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this so it first happened in like a in one of the tournaments. I think it was the Rome Open. There was one of the photographers that was taking photos of me, and I, I think I'd done like three or four IBJJF tournaments, uh, weekend after weekend. Mm -hmm. And one of the photographers was taking pictures, and every time he took a picture of me, he caught me in an omoplata, <laughs> and he he couldn't speak much English. So he would just come over, like turn his camera to show me the photo of me and an omoplata. Yeah. And then, ha oh, ha, omoplata man. And I was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't really take anything from it, but he kept repeating it every week. It was, was calling me omoplata man. I was like, hey, he's got something there. Yeah. Uh, so then I started the seminars pretty quickly after that. Uh, so I started teaching a brown belt a little bit with uh, the omoplata man seminars and then just uh, took it worldwide. But I've been doing the omoplata for... Since I was like a, a yellow belt, yeah, it's it's funny. I was we we never you don't really get taught it as a kid because obviously it's an illegal technique under under juvenile. Yeah. Um, but I I started using it and was just landing in that position really strangely, just naturally pulling my foot over the person's face and getting there. But I had no idea how to finish. <laughs> and then Victor Steamer would be watching me like a twelve year old Bradley. I'm a flattering people. He's like, oh, you can do an omoplata. I was like, what? <laughs> a what? And the, then he, he went through the technique with me, and then that was my my very first learning of an omoplata. Oh, cool. So yeah, yeah. But you at the the, the tournament uh, at IBGF tournament where you got kind of caught on camera all the time. Was that a coincidence that he caught you in an omoplata, or do you really, or did you use uh, the technique so much uh, at the time? 
Yeah, I, pretty much uh, at least once in a tournament, I was catching people in my Mabatas. Yeah. At that point, I probably about my game was very limited to my guard, and I was only catching Mabatas or footlocks. So if I could get people in 50-50, then I'd finish footlocks. Yeah. And if I didn't get you in 50-50, then I was just looking for an Amapata. Right. So it was, uh, it was really a 50% chance yeah. or, or of me catching one of those instead. Yeah. And where did you get your Omoplata details from? Who took? Uh, so, it, in the sort of Gracie Baja team, there's loads of people that are really good at it. If you look from the lineage of Zay Hagiola, there's a lot of his instructors, uh, a lot of his black belts that are really good at the black belt, uh, at the Omoplata. Yeah. Uh, so I we had Otavio Souza over in Birmingham for a long time, mm -hmm. and his game is. Is really good, and he's the one that introduced the Amapata bar to me. So I have like a whole chapter in this uh, series of Amapata bars, cool. which a lot of people neglect or they, they don't know yet uh, how effective the arm bars are from the Amapata situation. There's a lot of people caught trying to finish the shoulder lock, and that becomes uh, so much of a chase to get to the person's uh, shoulder to finish the, the submission that the, the arm bar is readily available at a lot of points. Uh, so that's what so a lot of things that Otavio showed. You see him in a lot of his matches where he catches uh, arm bars really, really fast, which just pulls the guy's arm and it gets like a screaming tap. It's uh, those are the the ones that you try to catch. Uh, and I also train with uh, Bruno Alves. He's just moved to uh, Sydney. He has a school in Sydney now, uh, but he, he has a really good overclatter as well. But it all comes from from Zay's lion. There are like obviously Victor and Braulio uh, are really good at the Victor's really good with his armbar from the close guard. Braulio really good with his triangle chokes. Yeah. And then the the guys that had were closer to my frame, the shorter, stockier people like Otavio and Bruno, were awesome in the Emma Plata. Right. Okay. So I think it's just a an understanding of the basics and that those things will all come together. Your armbar, triangle, Emma Plata, and the, at one point you'll master one of them. And I, I was never that great at finishing triangles. My legs are still a little bit short. So if I can get them and close them, then I can get the tap. But trying to close them is still the hardest thing in the world. So a lot of times I switch off to the Amapata, and that's where the understanding comes from because I'm spending so many more hours in that submission as opposed to hunting arm bars or trying to finish triangles just right. because of uh, the, the difficulty of trying to close it. Yeah, makes sense. And were there other people uh, besides the people that actually taught you? Were there other people that inspired you with certain details or variations, uh, maybe online that you've been following? Yeah, the, uh, the first instruction I had was from uh, Cabrinha. So like, uh, I had a, a friend in the academy that was like, oh, watch this and gave me a DVD. And then I put it, this must have been when I was a blue belt or maybe even a green belt. I was watching these. And um, it was a Cabrinha speaking Portuguese with Japanese subtitles across the bottom. So you, you couldn't understand anything he was saying. I just had to, to watch the technique and try to pick it up that way. Uh, but that actually really helped in terms of picking up techniques now. So if I see, see someone compete, I don't have to wait for them to tell me the details of what they did. I can really try to, to dissect the information just from watching the competition footage. Um, so the, the, those instructionals really actually helped. Yeah. But I spent a lot of time watching Cabrini just over and over. It's, yeah. uh, I, I, even at the, when he's speaking Portuguese, I would turn off the Portuguese and put music on and then just go into a trance of watching like three hours worth of Cabrini doing techniques. Yeah. And they, they were the coolest videos. I think they were made in Japan with like the bull terrier guys. Because they've all got yeah. like funky geese on. They're all wearing like red geese with the bull terrier logos and things. But the, those were like some great series of instructionals. Yeah. And and when you would like study an instructional like that, would you uh, also like take notes or would you just look at it and remember it and try to uh, to give it a go at the first training? Yeah. Usually, what I do is I grab my mom. <laughs> so at the time, <laughs> I would say, "Mom, can you come here real quick," and I'd go into the living room and then try to do, practice the technique with her. <laughs> so many times we did jujitsu on the carpet with yeah. my mom just rolling around. It was crazy. <laughs> um, but when, once I got uh, once I'd been through the instructional, then I didn't need to practice it so much, and then I can just watch. 
I tried to watch two, one or two techniques that I really liked that I wanted to add into the game that then I would try to practice in my sparring the next day. Uh, and then if it didn't work, and a lot of times you, you, you're a bit cloudy when you get there and you, you don't quite understand every detail to it. So you go back and watch again and then you realize, ah, my foot should have been here instead. And then you fix it again for the for the second training session or the third. Yeah. So that, that's pretty much how it goes. I try to pick one or two that I really like the look of and then I try to hit it in sparring. But obviously sparring with people of the same level as me that's going to be really hard to do. Yeah. So you, you immediately grab the blue belt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and would you also do like some specific sparring maybe, or you would also, you only do it like during the regular sparring where everybody goes all out. Yeah. Now I do because I have so much more control over my training. Yeah. Back when I was sort of a green and blue belt, uh, you, you pretty much have to do whatever the instructor is telling you to do. Yeah. So that's where I sort of make the specific training, my free sparring. So when it's like, all right, guys, let's do rounds, five minutes on the clock. That's when, in my mind, I'm saying, okay, I have to finish Lama Blatter. Or all I want to do is try to get to this move. Yeah. So even when, like, Kimuras are readily available or the guy's giving me a triangle choke, I'm still trying to find the certain move that I want to practice because of the instruction I watched last night. Yeah, yeah, so you kind of force the specific sparring then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's interesting. Earlier you talked about also... Uh, uh, learning the omoplata already before you uh, got out of the juvenile uh, age range, mm -hmm. uh, as it being a illegal technique. What what's it like? What was it like? Because I, I can imagine quite a few people in your generation, our generation, that that did not uh, start jujitsu at such a young age, but they started when they were already adult, and and uh, they didn't have those kind of restrictions. What was it like for you to progress from juvenile to adult and that kind of transition and having additional techniques at your disposal uh it's quite nice because you have the you have these different tiers it's almost like because you're learning the, this martial art for such a long time that you're gonna hit bumps in the road and you're gonna have plateaus so when you when you're told at blue belt you can now start to do um plateaus and straight ankle locks it, it starts to give you another focus. Oh, let, let me learn that. And I try to get the instructionals that coincide with those moves. And I then I started uh, spending a lot of time on the 50-50 guard when I first got my blue belt because I wanted to start to work on the foot lock. And this was at the time we were we were starting to prepare the esteem lock. So it was around 2009 when we were first learning the esteem lock as well. Yeah. And then the functions of that in comparison with a straight foot lock all at the same time. Um. So it, it actually helps just to give you an extra boost. It's like a um, Mario Kart when you go over the the, the arrows to, to get a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. It's when when you get to the belt and it says, okay, now you can learn this. Then I'm really focused on trying to learn that move. And then again, when you get to brown belt, now I can start doing knee bars and toe holds. Then you, you start to go there. I think there's an element where you need to be learning this beforehand just a, a brief understanding of everything that you're doing. And then you can really divulge into the deeper understanding of it once you have the belt. And then you could start practicing in competition as well. Um, but it, it is quite nice to have the restrictions to then uh, go ahead with it once you do have the, the time to practice. Right. But it, when, when I'm training, there is almost no restrictions. So that like uh, I was on a platter and people as a yellow belt. <laughs> and then it's just like don't do that in competition <laughs> so yeah the, there's a lot of times where you, you you know that you can't practice you can't use it in competition but i'm still practicing it pretty right. much every time at the gym i mean the, i was toe holding people as a green belt <laughs> it was i really have a, a horrible moment of uh, i was training with one of the brown belts i caught him in a toe hold and i was just uh, this is the first time where i popped somebody's ankle and I'm just pulling it and pulling it. And the, and the guy is like, obviously, I was a 15-year-old at the time. So he's like, I'm not tapping to this kid. <laughs> and I pulled a little bit too hard. And I've got his foot right next to my ear. And it just, you could you can see the ankle, just the, the ligaments give way. To like the strings on a, on a bow. Oh, and uh, it, it just snapped. And it's such a loud noise in my ear. I was, I was like, oh, God, this is horrible. But then I learned to love that that horribleness. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have a walk again? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, he got it straight away, and then yeah. tried to like. But it was like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, but then was limping away from the mat. So. Yeah, yeah, tough guy. So, so what would you say are the, in your opinion, the best things about Omoplata? Why did you come to love it so much? Uh, for me, it just allows me to uh, maneuver myself around, so I can sweep and I can submit with the Omoplata. And then I can find other submissions inside of it without ever having to leave the Amapata. So one thing, like when I teach my seminars, I, I tell people that I die a little bit inside whenever somebody just takes a sweep from the position. <laughs> so obviously one of the great things with the Amapata is that you can sweep, come up to top position. If I then re-roll back to the submission again, I don't lose any points and I've just racked up two. Right. And then I can, I, the guy rolls out of my Amapata a second time. I maintain my top position. I've got another two, so it's now four zero. So I'm racking up points each time I'm trying to submit this person, um, which was the first part that I thought was like a little loophole in the rules that I'd found. I was like, wow, this is really cool. I could just keep scoring points with this person. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like the advantage in the 50-50, like it, when that was around and you could score advantages in 50-50, so I just never came on top. I'd put them on the ground and they'd lie back down again. And then just, uh, there's one fight, I won eight advantages to nil because I was just sweeping him in 50 <laughs> 50. Yeah. But in terms of the other blatter, it's one of those positions that I'd like to be able to just hold on to until I get the submission eventually. I know that it's with with an arm bar or a triangle, it's much more of a sprint. If I, if I latch onto your arm and I pull, it's either you escape very quickly or you I get the tap. Whereas the Amapata is, the guy has to really work hard to get out of the position because I know that this is much more of a marathon now and I'm trying to chase his arm. Uh, at some points, there'll be some people where the arms go numb in my Amapatas because I've been holding on to it for so long. I had a match at Brown Belt and I pulled guard, Amapata the guy within the first 30 seconds and we finished the match in that same Amapata. It's right. crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's a strong position. So, yeah, I, I just like I like the ability of not having to come out of that position. So that w one of the things that I, I struggled with as I was coming up the ranks was I, I really focused on my guard game. And once I'd sweep, I'd have no understanding of how to pass the guard. So I'd almost sweep myself just to go back into guard so I could then try to get a submission. Because <laughs> being on top, I was, was going to get tapped at some point. Um, Whereas the Amapata is that position where I can come up on top, I can take the sweep, but I'm not in any danger or any threat of a submission. I have the ability to uh, backstep back into the Amapata or transition into triangles or monoplatas, move into arm bars or access the back. There's a lot of different um, versatility with the movement. Uh, and at the same hand, there's so many entries to it. The, I catch the Amapata so often from a shallow lasso because people's elbows aren't tucked in onto their knees. Yeah, And it's one of those basic things you're told as a white belt when you stand up and close guard. Keep your elbow on the inside, but then you start sparring, you forget about it, the elbow starts creeping out, and it's uh, it's just available. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I remember a few years ago, you were here to give some classes and do a small camp, and you taught us some Omoplata details as well, and uh, I still use them today, so I'm really looking forward to the to the nice. DVD and uh, see what else uh, uh, you, you can teach yeah, us. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, where, where can people get the DVD if they want to want to buy it? Uh, it's on the grappleclub.com. So it's in collaboration with the Grapple Club. They, they've done a lot of uh, high-level instructions already with sort of Kane and Duarte and uh, Theon Davis. Yeah. Um, so be up there on their website. You can go through. I'll have a, a link in my bio later today. It's going up live uh, tonight. Oh, cool. Great. What what uh, what what do you think in if you compare it to existing Omoplata material? What is special about this series? Uh, I think going into the detail of how to maintain it. This was the part that I didn't didn't learn from anybody else. One is the Omoplata bars. This is pretty much exclusive that I've never really seen anybody do apart from Otavio. Mm -hmm. And Otavio doesn't have any videos out, so that you, unless you go and trade with him in Huntington Beach, you're probably not going to learn. Uh, so the Amapata bars is, is sort of exclusive to this DVD. And the other part to it is the understanding of how to finish and maintain. 
So when people are rolling out of the Yamapata, there's a lot of times where people don't explain how to stop the person from escaping and how to maintain the submission for, for a long period of time. Um, a lot of it is, a, there's a lot of time spent on entries and grips to finish or sort of flattening your opponent as opposed to countering cartwheels or forward rolls where I spend a lot of time on those situations. Yeah. So if somebody forward rolls, I come up to top position, I forward roll again or I back step over the head. If they cartwheel, I turn my knee inside, then it comes into a, a mopata bar. So I have a lot of different finishes in terms of the defenses. Yeah. Right. That's nice Good stuff. Yeah. Well, well, we'll put a link to the uh, the Grapple Club uh, website uh, down in the description. So if you're watching this and want to check out Bradley's DVD, then, then go there. But first finish this interview, of course. <laughs> Keep watching. Um, I was wondering, you, you coach a number of female competitors, such as uh, Laura, Rose, uh, your sister. How, how did this come about? Like, uh, there are quite a few uh, successful female competitors also. Is this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a little bit of a specialty, I guess. H how did this come about, yeah. would you say? I, I don't really know how. I, I suppose I'm in a family full of uh, women. So obviously I'm a, I'm a twin with my sister. Mm -hmm. And then my cousin, Laura, started training with us as well, along with her sister. So the, pretty much the whole of our family started training jiu-jitsu with each other at the age of sort of 12 and Laura was 14. Um, and we're all training with each other, but it's, it's pretty much me and three girls inside the sort of close family that we have. Right. Um, so that you learn pretty quickly to the sort of sensitivity required with, with training with women and teaching women, uh, yeah. because there's, there's a lot of times where you're going to have uh people have their off days and they don't want to they don't want to train or they're they're not going to take the the techniques um as normally as they would do so sometimes you want to teach something and they're not so receptive to your teaching so you need to know to when to back off and when to put pressure at the same time because so obviously we, i think with a lot of a lot of guys that you coach and it's very much like let's train hard every day and even when they they don't want to train, let's let's do some more. And with the with the girls, you especially with uh, a lot of my family, I can't do that so much because you you can see where they need a rest or some things are a bit difficult. And then you need to tell them when to take a step back and when to have a relax or who to train with and and guide them along those lines as opposed to just. This is the technique you need to use. Go and smash. Yeah. Um, so it obviously started. I was teaching um, my cousin Laura first. So uh, we all started training with each other. Laura got a blue belt from Victor when she turned 16, and then she stopped training for five years. And pretty much my whole family stopped, and then I carried on training. And then at this point, I just got my black belt, and then I was preparing to go. Oh no. I think I was still a brown belt. I was preparing to go to the Noki Pans. And uh, Laura started talking to me again, saying about how uh, she was missing jiu-jitsu and that she wanted to come back and give it a try. And I said, oh, great, come along. So then we started doing some private lessons. And I think we all got a bit excited about the idea of competition. So we're like, yeah, let, I'm going to New York. You may as well come with me. Let's go into the Nogi Pans. And obviously she, she hadn't trained at all in five years. So we were doing private lessons every day. She did the British Open first. Uh, we did the Nogi British Open and she won double gold after about three weeks of training. Um, just spending time on, <laughs> on my platters and, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, then we went to New York and she got double silver. She won silver in a division and then silver in the absolute. And then we went over to California for the Nogi Worlds and she got bronze. Nice. Um, and then it was all sort of all within this uh, time span of being back in jiu-jitsu for two months. And then I was sort of trying to explain to Laura, you could be really good at this if we keep going. We just need to spend some more time doing some privates. I can bring you up to a level. Then she got a purple belt, competed at purple, won the Europeans. The confidence came from the Europeans. 
and then she got a brown belt and then now she's meddling everywhere just won a european championship at black belt um and then since that time my sister started uh, came back to train as well uh she was uh started running a school with her fiance in newcastle and then she started to compete too so she'd come and visit me in london we do some training i we do some private training i teach her some of the stuff that we're working on and then melissa starts hitting some of the in competition as well uh it's, it's it's quite funny where uh me melissa and laura are pretty much only using them of platters in our matches like if you watch um and uh, most of laura's fights she she is the one person that probably hits them of platters more than i do <laughs> <laughs> because i think my game is a little bit more versatile where i'll, I'll sweep or i'll come up on top whereas laura is only going to over platter people it's quite funny yeah uh, and the melissa has developed like a real hunger for finishing submissions so she's trying to get the tap all the time. So her first comp- her first IBJJF competition, um, she caught one of the girls with the uh, the choke from the other platter. Yeah, yeah. Which I, was was beautiful. It's really nice to see. <laughs> um, so yeah, in terms of the teaching, I think it just comes from experience. Obviously, Laura is um, is one that I'm most harsh on because it's sort of like um, more of like a uh brother relationship that a sister cousin do you know what i mean yeah. rather than it being a, a treater like a girl a lot of times she's just here with the guys so we just we we behave that way around her a lot of times and then you have to remind yourself that actually uh she she is a lady and sometimes they need to be treated that way when when you are training um so yeah you, you develop a certain sensitivity towards it you start to study the the sort of the competition around them so like i when laura's coming through i'm looking at the whole medium heavyweight division seeing who she's got to fight because for me like it's hard to do that at blue belt but when you start to get to purple brown and black you really start to see the same faces all the time so i can really start to to uh, watch footage yeah of the people she's going to compete against and then I can say, oh, you need to pull on this person, or you could take time pulling guard on this person. They're going to leave their elbow out from this side, or they lead with their right knee instead of their left knee. So you're going to have to um, apply to the back arm. Like those sort of details that I sort of say to Laura, and then it just becomes more of like uh, like I'm playing a game, and I have the remote controls yeah, for the yeah. coaching area. And then it's just like, okay, left hand here, right hand sleeve. And then we, we go through the fight pretty much together. Um, and then obviously I met Sam in 2015 and then we, sat, we started training with uh me and samantha started training with each other and then we trained and i think her first i was trying to flow and i have a very transitional game where i tried to move around quite a lot in my sparring and then samantha had stopped and was like what is this i was like what do you mean is jiu-jitsu and i think she'd come from a from a group of people that were pretty much the guys that she trained with just very heavy pressure passing people stopping everything that never let it get started yeah. where i think with a lot of uh training we, and this is the same if i'm training with a, a blue belt or a juvenile or a guy lighter than i am or a female you you have to have an element of give and take and you need to let the position get so fast that then i can start to move with the person so, for instance, if um, most recently I've been working with Melissa with some heel hooks. So I'm going to allow her to get so far to enter into my legs. Once she's got to a good position, there now I start my defense. And then it develops the confidence in her to know that she can get there. And then she starts working into the finishing on someone of a higher level as well. Because I'm going to give uh, reactions of, the, of a higher level person. So then that she can catch those people that she's training with the other purple belts when she gets there but it develops the confidence in the first place as, as opposed to uh, us training. And then I'm like, okay, pull harder today. And I just go and smash right. people that I train with. It's more instilling the confidence and belief in your training partners and students yeah. that I think really helps with, with my coaching as opposed to anything else. Did, did you also play that role in the beginning when you guys started at, what did you say, age 12 or 13? Like, yeah, no, I used to get beat up as a 12 year old. <laughs> Laura would uh, would smash me. She'd put me in close guard and, and squeeze me until I tapped and like triangle me all the time. <laughs> I had I, I was really bad as, as a kid. Like uh, Melissa was the most technical. 
and then Laura would just beat me because uh, she was just better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so as a 12 year old, I was like the worst person in the room. The only reason I, I'm like as good as I am now is because I didn't stop training. Right. They did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when you're um, uh, tra training with them and um, you, I, I assume you take on more of like a, a, a trainer or coaching role uh, when you give them mm -hmm. kind of the position and then start working. Or do you also get something out of it yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, because it allows me... The, I do this with a lot of my training where I let, let the position get so far. Because uh, I need to be able to practice it in a free sparring sense as well as specific training. Yeah. So you've got to be able to feel the, the entries and then you see where the escapes would come. And then you slowly progress it to okay I, I let you get to the entry now i'm gonna let you elevate me and start to get into single leg x but i'm not gonna let you get this far and then i start preventing it from that point yeah sort of reverse engineering it so i, I go into the worst point first and then yeah. when they start tapping me <laughs> then we start reversing <laughs> it back a bit and let, let try to prevent it from that point yeah and yeah. then obviously uh, on occasion it will just be a normal free sparring round but yeah. again i'm going to make it a fun training session where we can both uh get to some sort of positions and have some advantage at some point as opposed to me just uh mounting and squashing in the mountain yeah, yeah. finishing the round there yeah. um so yeah i i with a lot of my trainer even if i'm training with other black belts there'll be times where i will let them pass my guard so that i can work on my side control escapes yeah because it, you see the the highest level guard players they have the really good guards, but then they have no one, no understanding of how to escape side control. So if the worst ever does happen and they get their guard passed, you see a lot of high level guard players. If you ever get past the guard, that's basically tapping them. That's yeah. worse than, than tapping a yeah. guard player. So if you get to there, they just lie still until you mount them and choke them or you take the back. It's almost like they gave up once you get past the legs. Yeah. So it's one of those things where I want to be comfortable in a lot of situations. Like I, I'm really comfortable. Somebody gets onto my back, I can find a way out, and I, I can still find an escape and get back to a, a good position. Yeah. But that just comes from letting people get there. Because yeah. if I was playing my A game all the time, obviously my A game would be through through the roof. But then the times where I do get passed in a competition or somebody gets past my legs, then I'm done, and I may as well just tap out at that point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good Makes to know. Sense. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, I, th I think you're a really good coach as well, uh, and you're still competing. Um, is there in the future like uh, one path you, you would you like to um, uh, pursue both still, or are you going to like uh, maybe switch more to coaching or uh, and keep competing, or do one or the other, or do keep doing both? Um, one sec, let me just put this on charge. I'm losing a bit of uh, <laughs> charge. Nice. It's Different over angle. There. Um, almost there. Well, th this is the difficulty that I have at the moment is trying to pick one because it's it's almost like the whole uh, choice with gi and no gi. Yeah. There's a lot of no gi super fights that I've had. And then there's, there's guys that I compete with that do amazing at ADCC. And then... I think to myself, well, if I was training exclusively Nogi, then I could be beating these guys and I could be going to ADCC, but there's still a part of me that still really wants to compete in the Gi because I like the, the grips that I have and the game that I play. Yeah. Um, when it comes to competing and coaching, is the I, I love coaching because... It really gives me it gives me a sense of fulfillment taking people from like one level and and take, like letting them see the next uh, and just watching them compete is is really exciting. Like a lot of times I get way more nervous watching yeah. Laura or Melissa or Sam compete as opposed to me competing myself. But there's still there's not quite the rush that you get when you when you fight and you you put on such a show that I, that that still excites me at the same time. So I think at some point I will be uh, sort of exclusive to coaching, okay. but not yet. I have a few more uh, a few more goals to to tick off before I become a full time coach. I, I the last not last year the year before I think it was two thousand. 
was it last year? I think la last year I spent the whole year just coaching. So from 2019 to, yeah, the 2019 season, uh, I didn't fight the Europeans. I could have, I, I could have got the points. I could have fought there. I didn't fight the Europeans. I didn't fight the Pan Ams and I didn't fight the Worlds because I wanted to coach. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, I, I, it's very difficult for me to do both. So if I'm going to go to a world championship, I can't coach the people I'm with on the same day because they, then I've put so much energy into their matches that by the time I need to compete, I'm sort of like a, a wet balloon and I just go, and I get my guard pass or I'm, I'm done for. Um, so there's an element of me saying, okay, this, this competition is for me to do. And these are competitions that I'm going to come as a coach and change things around. If they're competing on different days, so obviously Melissa's a purple belt, then I can manage that so much easier because then it's yeah. like, okay, on Thursday I'm a coach and Saturday I'm a black belt competitor. But now that everybody's getting to the same belt <laughs> level and we're all black belts together, it's just impossible. So it's pretty much I take I, I either decide to, to be a coach, and this is where we sort of got invested in uh, Sam and Laura's uh, competition run last year, 2019. They both won the Europeans. Uh, Laura won the pans, and then we went to the world championships, and they both medaled at the world championships as well. So it's a really successful year for yeah. like the people that I'm coaching. Yeah. Um, and now it's time for you again. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I I, I enjoy both. I, yeah. I really uh, enjoy the the coaching aspect and bringing up the level, um, and competing at the same time. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah and I can imagine they depend on you a little bit as well as a coach to to be there and to help them uh, get those medals, of course. And when you're not there, yeah, then maybe exactly. someone else has to do it and it might not go as well. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. definitely paying off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we we uh, we have some questions from people on social media uh, following our account. Okay. Uh, Bram collected those. Yeah. Um, the first one is, of course, a very important question. It's um, where can I buy the best burger in London? <laughs> the best burger in London. Wow, I have a lot of research on this. <laughs> <laughs> I would the top most three. recently. <laughs> so obviously, I live in East London, and most recently, the best burger I've had is from Burger and Beyond. Okay. It's in it's in Shoreditch, so like, like nice hip area. Uh, but Burger and Beyond is probably the best one. Uh, Obviously, oh. we have Five Guys and Byron Burger and all those sort of things. Yeah. yeah. But Byron Burger used to be good two years ago. Now it's become a little bit commercialized and uh, it's a, not so good anymore. <laughs> but I was I would go for Burger and Beyond. Okay. Or Patty and Bun. If I had a second choice, Patty and Bun is very good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> They'll be happy to know <laughs> when they go to London. That's some quality answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the second question is: uh, What inspires you to work towards your goals? Um, I think at the moment, uh, with jujitsu, the part that really inspired me to to train jujitsu is the limitlessness of jujitsu. Yeah. So that well, I obviously started in traditional martial arts at the beginning, and there's there's a lot to learn there, but there's only so many striking combinations I can put together before I get a little bit bored of punching a pad. Yeah. Whereas I I trained jujitsu for the first time. One of my first classes was on single leg X, and it absolutely blew my mind. And then single leg X is just such a basic thing now, and that then like even today I'm learning new things and I'm entering in wormholes with the uh, worm guard and things like that. There's, there, there's a never ending possibilities of new techniques yeah. that you've never seen before. And then, then you go and train with, with one of your best training partners. And you're like, whoa, what did I just do? <laughs> do that again. Do that. And then you, you find something new again. Um, so that that's the, the part of jujitsu that I really enjoy. Uh, the other inspirations are obviously all, all the people that I'm coaching. Um, because it, for me to expect them to perform at their best and to, to go and win world championships, I have to uh, show them as a competitor as well. So I, I want to put myself out as the, the best possible stance to show the people that I'm coaching that this is what it, what it should look like to an extent. So that, that, that's what I'm trying to get to do. 
Yeah, nice. Um, and then the, the last question we had is, uh, what is your opinion on the figure four when going for the Oma Plata? Oh, yeah, not not a good choice. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. <laughs> it's like wrist locking people in Oma Platas and things like that. This is, I, I never tend to do it because the moment you start addressing the, the feet, you've released the arm and you, you're not going to finish the, the Oma Plata. Yeah. So for me, I stay on a lot of upper body attacks from the Omoplata. So if it, for me to attack the toe hold, I'm, I'm laid down. So um, I probably wouldn't stay laid down in that circumstance. As soon as I get the Omoplata, I'm, I'm trying to reach up to grab onto the far shoulder. Yeah. Um, maybe like as opposed to the toe hold, if I was if I wasn't so comfortable in the Omoplata and wanted to go somewhere else, then I would look at going into a matrix, like what you oh, see yeah. Tommy yeah. and Espen use. Yeah. I think that is a lot more high percentage than a toe hold. Um just because I think the toe hold from that position, the knee isn't secure. We're yeah. not in a good enough not, not a good enough leg entanglement to get the finish. Um but obviously switching to a matrix is now into a high percentage back attack where I can then get loads of finishes from there. Yeah. So yeah, I would probably go to if, if you if you're looking at letting go of the other platter to go towards the feet, I would go to the matrix as opposed to the toe hold. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We arrived to our Shark Tank section of the interview, where I have a few quick questions, and you just say the first thing that pops into your mind, or the, some of them are yes or no questions. Um, mm -hmm. ADCC or IBGF? Oh. Uh, you already talked about hard. you find this it a depends. bit hard to you have to choose you want to do both yeah yeah the, this depends on what time of the year <laughs> so if it gets like two weeks before worlds then i'll say adcc because i'm fed up with gripping sleeves right but then i i'm preparing for adcc and all i want to do is grab onto a gi i'd be <laughs> right. yeah yeah all right always the <laughs> the garden of the neighbor looks better that type of yeah, yeah. <laughs> um jokes or locks uh locks i'm a platist <laughs> maybe a bit similar answer a favorite technique uh i'm a platist <laughs> <laughs> yeah favorite competitor besides yourself oh oh okay this is a tough one i have so many like uh, uh victor steamer mm -hmm. is a is a is high up there because of watching him and he's so explosive but then I also love like Rafael Mendes and the clean technique of Rafael. And then I, I also like the aggression of like a Claudio Calazans. Yeah. Do you think you also like so, Victor, especially because you've seen him from so up close and maybe you start to appreciate certain parts of his game more yeah, than you would definitely. see him on TV? Yeah. Yeah. Like I've never celebrated more for somebody's victory than when Victor beat Calazans one year at the World Championships. <laughs> and the, the whole Gracie Barras time was standing up screaming and shouting. Yeah. But it, it, that, that was one of those matches that he's obviously been trying to beat Kazans for such a long time. Yeah. They had this like ongoing rivalry. And then he finally got him at the World Championship and beat him. Um, that, that was a really special moment. So, yeah, it, it, it's definitely, definitely plays a role being able to train with him every day and then go and see what he can do in the competition. Right. Makes sense. Um, favorite Guy? Ooh. You're not locked to Gracie Baja anymore? No, no, no. Uh, well, I'm currently sponsored by Scramble. So my favorite right. one is the uh, <laughs> Midnight, like the all black. Yeah. The, that, that, one is, that one's beautiful. Right. I, I like black geese. Favorite snack? Oh. Uh, it used to be a Mars bar. Do you guys know Mars bars? Yeah. Yeah, they're illegal yeah, they're probably here. Probably a Mars bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no that, that's a good snack. Yeah. Uh, favorite country to travel to and train there? Ooh, uh, probably California. Yeah. But it, I I I don't like California so much anymore, but it it does have really nice training. Or New York, because I I I much prefer New York as opposed to California. Yeah. But I get the training is is very different. Like I obviously have friends in, in California. I don't have so many friends in New York. Why would you say the training is very different? Uh, so New York is very, um, there's a lot of no-gi there, isn't there? 
So yeah. there's a, if you go to if you go to Henzo's, you're pretty much going for John Danaher's class. Mm-hmm. So you're going for Nogi. If you go to Unity, then you're going for the Pujada. <laughs> yeah. And if you go to Marcelo's, you're going to see Marcelo. So and I think Marcelo only teaches on uh, one certain day. Um, but the 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 actions that you get from all those different people are so different. Like if you go to California, there's so many schools. Yeah. where you're training in one gym and training another, and you're going to get the same reaction from both competitors. Whether if I go to a Gracie Baja school or I go to a Chetmat school, I'm going to get a very similar game. Right. Whereas Marcelo's, if I go to Marcelo's, you have this almost scrappy uh, kick in your legs, getting to the single leg X, trying to sweep uh, at all cost and a very like aggressive sparring position. And then you go to Unity, and then it's berimbolos and inversions and like the complete opposite of any entering with butterfly guard, where it's it's a complete contrast. Where you can't you can't use the same game in both gyms. Right. Whereas it, if I go to California, I can pretty much just comfortably train with everyone the same way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's more a unified style, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what has been your toughest opponent so far? Oh, I fought uh, Izaki by Haynes a few times. That's a pretty tough, yeah. tough one. I fought Gustavo Batista at the World Pro. That was a good match as well. And I think Batista's uh, uh, underrated. Um, but probably the toughest is uh, Adam Vosinski. Okay. Oh, wow. We fought each other like eight times. <laughs> yeah. He's probably the toughest. Yeah, we will be interviewing him later today. So I would also later I'll ask you uh, a little bit about that. Uh, knee reaping in the gi? Uh, no, I, I like the cleanliness of uh, of IBJJF. Yeah, I leave my knee reaping for ADCC training. <laughs> what would you be doing if you didn't do jujitsu? If that wasn't oh, in your God. life, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I pretty much only do jiu-jitsu, so I don't know what else Never I would do. Yeah. Obviously, I was I was training traditional martial arts first, and with the first thing that captured me was wrestling. I really liked people like I used to watch the UFC, so I liked people like Matt Hughes and and the big wrestlers. Yeah, I didn't like the jujitsu inside <laughs> the UFC until I started to learn it for myself. Um, I was a pretty good football player before I started before I switched to jujitsu. Um, maybe I'd be uh, a football player. <laughs> yeah, but definitely something in athletic sports. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, who in your weight class would you really like to fight? Still, Ooh. Ooh. Uh, I'd like to compete with Tommy Langacker. We fought each other at Purple Belt. I think that would be a really nice fight. Yeah, just a, a good, good technique, good showing of technique. Yeah. Um, um, well, here's a open, there's loads of, pe- open loads of challenge. people at Middleway. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're watching I, this, I can't Tommy. Think of anybody else. <laughs> the first one that springs to mind is Tommy. Yeah, we have a, a chain question. So we have people from the last interview that popped up a question for you. Um, uh, our last interview was with Daniel de Groot, Groot uh, a Dutch competitor. Um, he asked you who has had the biggest impact on your game outside of your former coaches. Oh, so outside of Bradley and Victor, it's either going to be, it's more than likely a Tavia for okay. all the Amaplata knowledge. Cool. And, and like any competitors or, um, uh, like people who didn't actually like uh, touch you directly that inspired you or where you picked some details or techniques from or did you whoever you studied mm. the outside of people that i've not actually trained with probably well ryan hall definitely I've watched so many of his instructionals and studied his games with Ryan for sure. But I, I can imagine um, for you, but, you already had like so many different uh, coaches and people to train with that there's already uh, quite a diverse uh, number of games that that they could teach you. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah. Yeah, that that's the thing with with training in Birmingham. We had so many black belts. 
and they were all really good at different things. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's the that's one of the good things with Braulio as a coach is that he's so good at explaining everything that you then create a, a versatile set of black belts. Yeah. So there are some people that are really good at deep half guard, some people that are really good in 50-50. Uh, I like to bear a bolo, and then there are other people that just play a single leg X. So you really mash together a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, but I think I, I would probably say half a Mendes was someone that I've that I've not really I've trained with him. We did a private lesson once, but as opposed to like n- without constant contact. Yeah. Probably half a Mendes. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, I, uh, you talked about Adam Wazinski uh, just now. Um, we will be interviewing him later today, and I was wondering if you have a question that you would like to ask him. Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, I don't know. I would like to know almost oh, how how he got so good. <laughs> <laughs> if you could, how how to word that question, sort of. How, how, not necessarily how he trains, because a lot of people, we all train pretty much the same way. But if there is anything, if there was one thing that uh, took him off track from being like uh, just a normal European competitor and then being one of the best in the world. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's also one, one of the questions we had from our followers. Like, uh, how, how did he come, become one of the best uh, competitors from the from Europe? So I think yeah, especially yeah. from from being in Poland. So obviously, uh, yeah. Finfo is his coach. Yeah, but he doesn't see Finfo on a regular basis. No. So then a lot of his work is done alone, well, or, or with with his own friends and training partners. Yeah. Uh, so they, that, that's really interesting. I would like to know where he gets so much pressure from. <laughs> right. <laughs> the fir- the first time I competed with him um, was a we were at purple. It was a purple belt, and. He was he was tall, and I, I I shouldn't be fighting in medium heavy in the first place. But he was a tall guy, but he didn't look like overpowering. Like when I first looked at him, I was like, oh, the, the, he looks more like a, a almost like a model, like a with, with the beard and <laughs> yeah. the hair and everything. Not necessarily like a strong guy that's going to crush you. And then he he got on top of me, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> just felt so much pressure. It's yeah. crazy. Of the two of you, who started growing their hair early uh, first? Uh, definitely me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think I inspired him at the checkmate camp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, well, that, that's an um, interesting question. Uh, uh, looking forward to ask that to Adam uh, later mm-hmm. today. Um, everybody uh, watching this, uh, we're uh, nearing the end of the episode, so I want to thank you for watching if you like this the series in general or this episode specifically make sure you subscribe and also let us know in the comments what you thought about the episode if you'd like to see more of this um um, bradley uh, thank you very much for spending your time with us we'll put a link to the new dvd in the description uh so people can check that out and um yeah we will probably be the first ones uh, going there ourselves (laughs) So thanks again and uh, hope to speak to you soon. I wish you all the best uh, getting out of the lockdown and and with your further uh, endeavors. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Hopefully we'll see you guys in Groningen soon. Yeah. And come and pay a visit once once we can start flying again. That would be awesome. That would be nice. (laughs) Cool. Thanks, Randy. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Take care.